first we're going to talk about the why and what of virtual textbook, and then we're going to talk about the different methods that we can use to compile uh, the web resources to make them available for students. Um, and the three areas are using link-based, or creating a link-based virtual textbook, uh, using downloadable content, and then creating a standalone PDF document that you can deliver to students. Um, the last thing that we're going to talk about today are the legal considerations of how to do this. So rolling right into it, uh, you might be wondering why I put the why before the what, but this is because this is how this sort of occurred for me, is I had a problem that I needed to fix, and a virtual textbook is the solution that I came up with. So the problem that I had is I am currently teaching an intermediate level software class, and I've taught this class a couple of years in a row now, and I simply could not find a good textbook. I used one textbook the first year, I used a different one the second year. I just couldn't quite find a good fit for the course material. Um, so basically, I was at a point where I was like, well, if I got this textbook and we only use chapters one through three, and I use chapter six out of this book, and the next thing I know, my students are going to have like a, like a $500 textbook bill, and that just wasn't going to work. So. Um, the why of a virtual textbook is because you can create customizable course content, so you can pick out the exact material that you need for your course. Um, you have access to the most up-to-date information because too often, uh, another problem we have with textbooks is that we're dealing with 2009 editions or 2005 editions for all that. Um, another why is that it's free for students. Um, I think that a lot of instructors are dealing with students who either don't have the money for textbooks for students who hold out until they're failing in midterm to buy the textbook or that sort of thing. Well, if we're providing free material to our students, um, we sort of get around some of those problems. Um, and then the last reason why a virtual textbook is a great idea is because with all of the trends in technology and education and online classes and all, all those um, maybe it's time we start getting away from paper textbooks. Um, I mean, a lot of textbook companies have already started heading in that direction with e-books. Uh, this is just sort of another iteration of that. Okay, so what is a virtual textbook? Um, basically, the way that I solved the problem in my classroom is, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble finding a good textbook to teach the software. Meanwhile, there are a ton of video tutorials out there on the web that are showing exactly what I want to do. They're just not in the textbook. Um, so a virtual textbook is you compiling all of these web-based resources um, and that could include tutorials, that could include reading material, interactive tools, videos, animations, infographics, and still images. And then you're going to take all that stuff and you're going to organize it in such a way that makes sense for your students. Um, and then you're usually going to present that information to them through a learning management system like Blackboard or eCompanion or Angel or whatever your college is. So here's some example of some of the web-based resources that you might uh, or you might be including in your virtual textbook. This is just an example of a math site that I found. Uh, it breaks down all these different algebraic concepts and sample um, uh, equations and things like that. Uh, there, there, when it comes to stuff that is in the public domain, uh, so for example, this is Frankenstein that was written in the 1800s, now in the public domain. A lot of that stuff, stuff is out there on the internet. So if you're teaching any kind of class that involves literature or reading, and it happens to be some of that older stuff. If I make students buy a book, and it's all out there for free. Um, another example is uh, Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia tends to be a good source for sort of cutting edge stuff. They, they tend to cite all of their sources and things. Um, so that can also be a resource that you can use. Um, more than likely, though, you are going to want video tutorials. So there's sites out there like Vimeo, etc., and they cover a wide variety of um, this is an example of an interactive web page. So this one deals with biology. Basically, you go in and you're able to view uh, human an anatomy at different levels. You can, you know, you can spin that little slider at the bottom and, and look at the body from different angles. You can zoom in and look at things. So it's interactive. It requires the user to actually go in and do some things. Um, and it's not just for biology. I mean, there's like accounting websites like this, and websites like this that are interactive or adapt to what they're doing. Um, so that is a example of an interactive page. Um, this is just an example of like a Photoshop tutorial. That's a lot of the stuff we teach in my department. Um, so there's a lot of software tutorials out there for Microsoft Word, for the Adobe Suite, um, for accounting software, all sorts of stuff. 
Um, and then lastly, uh, I want to talk briefly about Coursera. Um, some of you may have read articles about this. Basically, there's a, a lot of folks, um, especially Ivy League professors, who decided they were going to start presenting some of their course material online for free. And uh, they compiled all of this stuff at uh, Coursera.org. Um, and this is a great resource to use in the classroom. Um, and it's definitely vetted material. So if you haven't checked out Coursera, it covers a wide variety of things. Okay, so now that we've looked at some of some examples of some of those web-based resources, um, let's start talking about the ways that you can um, a, a virtual textbook in and of itself is actually a very simple concept, but where it gets complicated is how you present that information to students in a way that makes sense. Um, and it can also get complex um, when you get into some of the legal considerations, but we'll get to that in a bit. So compilation method number one is creating a link-based virtual textbook in your learning management system. Um, this is going to be the easiest method for just about anybody. Um, and the only software that you're going to need is an up-to-date internet browser that's compatible with your learning management system. So whatever you'd normally update Blackboard with, um, you, can, you can use that web browser. So um, here's an example of a virtual textbook that I'm using in my course. So we use Angel Learning at, uh, at my college, um, although we'll be switching to Blackboard soon. So this is just like my, my home page for my course. Um, and then when, when I go to my Lessons tab, I actually have a, a folder in here that's actually called Virtual Textbook. Um, I'd like to point out at this juncture that it's very important that at the beginning of the semester, you walk the students through how to use the virtual textbook. So you, you, you need to explain to them how you've organized these files and where they can access them and when they should check for updates and, and things like that. So I have a folder in here called Virtual Textbook. Um, within that folder, I have a folder for each week and I have the dates. Um, one thing that I do think I'm going to start doing is, is actually including a little bit more information here. Like, for example, week one should maybe say week one blending modes, January 7th through 8th. Because, that, because what, what I'm starting to see is students are coming to me now and they're like, hey, what week did we do that lesson in? So maybe including a little bit more, uh, a little bit more description in the title would be useful. Um, but I have it organized by week here. And then this is just an example of one of my weeks. So I have links to uh, a few different things in here. Um, I have a link to a Photoshop tutorial online. I have links to a four-part uh, four video tutorial series. Um, I also have a PDF document that I have created in here. Um, that's one of the cool things about building a virtual textbook is that not only can you integrate web-based resources, but you can also make your own material and just kind of dump it in with everything else. Um, and at the very bottom, I have a files folder because um, since we're working with software, I like to include files so that whenever I'm teaching it in class and I have the software up on a projector, we're all sort of on the same page doing the same thing. So the students are able to pop into the week and get all the good stuff that they need. Um, so this is just an example of what that tutorial page looks like when you open it up. It just, you know, they can either open it up inside of inside of Angel or it'll actually take them to the website externally. Um, this is just a quick example of the PDF document that I created. So, like I said, I was really having issues with this class because I could not find um, exactly what I needed for the class. And there are times when even on the web I can't quite find what I'm looking for. So this was something that I show the students how to do in class, and this is just something that they can refer back to. Um, you could obviously make this a little snazzier by adding images, um, or you could even create, and what I'll probably do in the future is I'll probably screen capture myself uh, working in the software and verbally explaining what I'm doing and actually upload that in addition to the sheet. But this was sort of a quick and dirty way uh, to just sort of integrate some of my own material here. Okay, so moving right along. Um, and this is just an example of what we're seeing in the files texture. Uh, I'm sorry, in the files folder. I was reading the first file there. And this is just the, the files that I gave the students to work with as we were going through the lesson. Okay, so let's talk about the pros and cons of a link-based virtual textbook. Um, it is going to be the easiest and the least time-consuming method for the instructor. You just have to go out on the internet and you have to find the materials that you want to use. And then you have to link to them. Um, it's going to be the easiest method to update. So, you know, your students come to you and they're like, hey, you know, there's a, you didn't put the right web page up or something like that. You can just go right in and change the link. Um, you don't need any special software. 
Um, a lot of times we have space limitations within our learning management systems, and so a, the link-based virtual textbook is going to have the least space requirements because all you're doing is basically putting links in there, and you, you might put a few PDFs or something that you've created. Um, the nicest thing about it and the biggest pro is that there's no legal questions about it because all you're doing is you're saying, hey, go to this website that's out there. Um, but there are some significant cons of a link-based virtual textbook, and that is this. You put up, say, a link to a video, and then a couple of weeks later your students are trying to access the material, and lo and behold, the user has removed the video. Or a website that you were using has completely disappeared, or maybe that tutorial got moved to a different spot. So the biggest con is that web content can change without notice. Links can go dead, content creators can remove videos. Um, and there's a couple of other things. Um, you're able to present this material to students, but you, there's no way for you to comment on it. Um, and some of the other compilation methods actually will give you that ability. Um, and then the other issue is that, and this is an issue for all three of the methods that I'm going to present, but sometimes web material can be inaccurate. Like maybe it's a good video and it's like 95% true, but there's a couple things you want to point out to students. Um, and, and so the ability to add comments would be helpful so that you can point those things out. Um, so those are the cons of a virtual, uh, I'm sorry, of a link-based virtual textbook. So let's start talking about compilation method two, which provides an elegant solution to fix some of those cons. Um, I will warn you, though, that as we start to get into methods two and methods three, there are going to be some legal, you know, some legal questions that pop up, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, so method two is that you are going to present students with downloadable content to use as a virtual textbook. Um, so in other words, they would instead of going in the learning management system and seeing a link to a web page, they would either see a PDF of that web page that they could download, or they would see a video that they could actually download as opposed to going to say YouTube or something like that. Um, the software that you're going to need for this, um, now there's more than one way to skin a cat and there might be some other software you can use, but I'm going to recommend Firefox as your browser and Acrobat Pro. Um, some of these methods that I'm going to show you, I actually believe that you could get away with Acrobat Reader, but I've been using Pro for so many years, I don't quite know the difference. So I'm going to recommend Pro, but for method two, I think you can get away with just Acrobat Reader, uh, which is a free program that most of us have. Okay, so basically, we're going to be dealing with two kinds of sources here, web pages and videos. So the first step is that we want to save static web pages as PDF documents. So the way that we're going to do that is you need to make sure that you have PDF Reader installed or Acrobat Pro installed. And what that's going to allow you to do is when you're in Firefox and you go to File, Print, instead of actually printing out a paper copy of the web page, there's going to be an option that you can drop down and actually so select Adobe PDF. Um, also, I just want to point out real quick. Um, so for the rest of this presentation, I have sort of outlined the areas to focus on in hot pink, or I guess that's fuchsia, but you know that way you can easily see what I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, and hopefully you guys will have access to be able to download the actual presentation, and you can go step by step, and you're just looking for those areas that are sort of highlighted um, with a square. Um, so you're going to drop it down, and instead of printing it with paper, you're going to select Adobe PDF. You're going to tell it where to save it. And then you're going to get a PDF document. Um, whenever you're saving a web page as a PDF document, one of the problems you're going to run into is that you end up with a lot of extraneous material. Like there might be advertisements or, or links to other articles on the same web page or links to other tutorials. And so sometimes when you print it out, you may only need the first three or four pages um, of that web page, and then you end up with like 17 pages of other stuff that you actually don't need. So the second step is that we need to remove excess, excess pages from the PDF document. Um, so to do that, um, when you open up Reader or Pro, at the top of the screen, um, there is a, a tab that says Tools. So you're going to want to click on that. And then you are going to want to scroll down to the pages that you want to um, delete, and you want to identify those page numbers. And then underneath your Tools panel, there is a, a section 
uh, there, so it says pages and there's a little arrow next to it. If you click on that arrow, the arrow spins down and it sort of exposes all these options. So underneath pages, there is an option to delete. So you are going to click delete. And then once you click that, you can actually delete the current page. It'll, it'll, it'll queue the current page up or you can actually select a range of pages and you can go ahead and remove your excess pages. Um, the next thing that you can do is you can add comments if desired. Now let me backtrack one second and say if all you want to do is remove pages, you want to go to File, Save at that point and then just use, and then use that document. But if you want to add comments, uh, you may want to do this prior to saving it. And there's a couple different ways that we can do this. Um, so going back to that top sort of uh, hit, that, that top bar in the, in, in the software, um, a couple items across from tools is the comment tab. And so if you click on that, um, there's a variety of ways that you can do this. Now, once again, if you are going to give your students a virtual textbook, one of the things that you need to do is instruct them on how to use it. So if you, if you intend on adding comments, you may want to let them know how to look for those comments or how you're going to add those comments. So one of the methods that I would suggest is there's something called sticky note, and I have it highlighted there. It looks like a little yellow word balloon. So when you click on that, you are able to click a spot on the page and you're able to enter a comment. So I would click on the page, I'd type in whatever my comment is, it could be as long as I want. Um, and then what that's going to do is it's going to make a sticky note on the page that appears as that bright yellow balloon. It looks kind of like a highlighter and it's just something that's really easy for your students to spot on the page. So they would know anytime they see that they need to click on it. Um, another cool thing is that when you add your sticky notes in the right hand column, there is a comments tab and that is going to list all of your comments for the entire document. So your students could actually jump from comment to comment if they wanted. It's also a really easy way for them to navigate the document and just sort of see, hey, um, I didn't see that comment or, or you know, that or, 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 yeah, they just get an overall sense of how many comments you've added to the document. Um, there are some other tools that you can use though. Um, there's a text tool. You could straight up just click on the page and just start typing so that your text appears on the page. Um, that does make it a little difficult for students to be able to discern what's your comment versus what is the text of the web page. Um, you can highlight text on the page or one of the coolest options is that you can actually embed audio in the PDF document. So there'd be a little audio icon and students would be able to click on that and then they would just hear you talking. So that's a really cool way to add comments as well. So, um, and then at the end of that process, um, if you did add comments, you'd want to go to file, save, and then it would save your comments, the pages you've deleted, all that good stuff. So now we have at this point, our static web pages as PDF documents. So we would just be able to go into the learning management system and just upload the PDF file like any other PDF file and we just want to indicate what, you know, give a description of what that is. So that's a way that we can upload static web pages. Um, another thing that we would probably want to do though is include video content. So um, this is pretty easy to do as well. Um, so Firefox uses something called add-ons, um, otherwise known as plugins. And if you go to Google and you do a search for Firefox plugin flash video downloader, I have found this to be the easiest and most reliable add-on. Um, and the first thing that pops up will be that. And then you're going to go to the add-ons page and you're going to want to add it to Firefox. Now this is not actually a piece of software that you're installing on your computer. This is a plugin that you're adding on to your existing Firefox. Um, and other browsers like Chrome and some other things have some similar things that you can do like this. Um, I just normally use Firefox. Um, okay, so once we have downloaded that and, and, the, and the, the add on is actually there, if you navigate to a page that has a video, the add on is going to auto detect a video on the page. And there is a blue arrow that is going to actually appear at the top of your page. Uh, let me just. That a little bit. Okay, so we have the um, we have the blue arrow at the top of the page. If we did not have that blue arrow, uh, like if it had a little, like if it had a cross through it, um, that would be bad um, because it would it, that means it didn't detect the video. But generally, when there's a video, it shows up. So you click on that blue arrow, 
and it is going to create a drop down and it is going to give you several different ways that you can download that video. Um, the reason why YouTube or Vimeo or any of these other sites has so many different versions of the same video is because there was a problem um, whenever mobile devices came around because everything used to be Flash. But now what happens is when you access YouTube, YouTube as a website is going to auto detect um, what your site is or, or what kind of device you're using and it's going to upload the appropriate kind of video that will play on that device. Um, what I will usually download is I will usually look for the H264 version, which is the MP4, and it looks kind of like a little, the icon looks sort of like a little Game Boy or something, um, and I will download that, and, and the file extension ends up being MP4. It's a pretty universal format that will play on most computers. So let's go ahead and go to the next one. Sometimes, however, Flash Video Downloader is not always going to detect your uh, video size and then it won't allow you to download the video. So if there's a video and you're just having a time trying to get it, um, there are some other Firefox plugins that will work as well. Um, and you can go to addons.mozilla.org and etc. You can see the link here. So if you go to that web page, um, it'll take you to some other stuff. You can do a search for video downloader and there's a bunch of other options there. So once you are doing that, um, those, those in, you're going to want to look at the instructions on how to use that. So for example, in my browser, in addition to Flash Video Downloader, I actually have another add-on installed, and it shows up in a different spot, which I have circled, you know, indicated here. So you would just want to go in and um, try to access it that way. Okay, so let me go to the next one. Okay, so let's talk about the pros and cons of using downloadable content in your virtual textbook. Um, the nice pro and the biggest pro is that you're going to avoid having to deal with, you know, you link your students to a video and they need that video to study for the final and you're, you're like a week away and then all of a sudden the video gets taken down and now your students are like, well, we can't study because the video is not there. So the content, if you use downloadable content, is going to be available to students throughout the entire term. Um, the students will be able to access um, web material that may otherwise be blocked on campus. I know a lot of us are in boats where you know our students can't get on YouTube, they can't get on Vimeo on campus, and maybe they don't have internet at home or they don't have a computer at home and they got to come to campus. So it's a way for you to provide that content in spite of blocks on campus. Um, the content's not going to change. The students can actually keep the content beyond the end of the term. So like if they just really love one of the tutorials, um, they could just go ahead and you know keep it for the long run. Um, as I showed you, you can add comments, including audio comments. If you're using PDFs, you can't really add comments to video content, but you can't. Well, there's some ways you could, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of this. Um, and the, the other nice thing is that you can easily recycle the content from term to term. So if you're teaching the same class back to back in the fall and the spring, you could just roll all that content right over into the next term. Um, but there are some cons too. This is going to require a lot more work on the part of the instructor. It also requires you to be a little bit more tech savvy. Um, there is another problem. Um, if, if there is a website that uses interactive content, sort of like the like the, the anatomy website that I showed you earlier, there's not a way for you to save that and have students be able to interact with it. They're gonna they're going to have to access that on the internet. Um, the space requirements could be large. You know, if you're talking about downloading video files and they're like, you know, some videos are two, three hundred megabytes a piece, um, it might exceed the, your your allowance on your LMS. Um, and you could get a warning message from your system administrator saying, hey, why is there two gigabyte? It's worth the stuff on here. Um, and then the other thing is, too, whenever you create PDF versions of your web pages, sometimes they just they just don't show up right. Like the, it, it, the formatting is all weird, or the background of the page disappears, or you know, and it just looks really ugly. Um, so sometimes there's formatting issues when you try to save a static page as a PDF. Um, it also requires some specific software, so we're no longer just talking about your internet browser. You now need Acrobat Pro or Acrobat Reader. Um, and the other thing is, is we do get into some potential legal questions here. So if a web page did go dead or a, or a content creator removed a video, uh, there could be a valid reason for it, you know, including that they don't want people to use the video anymore because maybe they have a better version of it out or something like that. So um, those are some cons to think about. Now, 
What I do want to talk about right here is that there is a way to sort of combine method one and two because method one is really nice and it's really easy for you to do, but you do you run into those problems of in the middle of the semester a video disappears or a web page changes or something like that. And you're like, oh, I just want to make it to the end of the semester with the same thing that I was teaching with. So compilation method 2.5 is that you're going to create a link-based virtual textbook, and that's what's going to appear in your LM. Yes, okay. Um, but then what you're going to do personally is you're going to go in and you're going to back up all the static web pages as PDFs, and you're going to download all the videos. You're not going to provide these to your students unless um, – you're in a situation where, uh, you know, a link goes dead in the middle of the semester or something, or maybe, you know, the videos are blocked on campus or something, so you're going to give them access to the video content or, or something like that. So this is sort of combining the best of both worlds. Um, and then what you're going to do is when you get to the end of the term, you're going to be like, you know what, that guy took that video down, and I'm going to respect his wishes, and I'm going to go ahead and, you know, I'm going to go find some other video to use in subsequent terms. Um, and so this is a really, really good combo method that really, it solves the problems of method one, but it gives you the versatility of method two. Um, okay, let's talk about compilation method three. This is creating a standalone virtual textbook. Um, for this, you're going to need Firefox, but once again, you could use another browser, like you could use, um, you could get into uh, Chrome or some other things, but I recommend Firefox. For this one, you absolutely have to have Acrobat Pro. You, you won't be able to get by with just the basic Acrobat Reader. Okay, so uh, next. Okay, so there's a lot of steps in this one, and I would really recommend going back over the, uh, you know, getting the actual PowerPoint or PDF of the presentation and going back through it. Okay, so basically what you're going to need to do is before you start this process, you're going to have to go out and you're going to have to gather all of your web pages as PDFs. Um, if you're creating material as PDFs, like you're, you're, you're creating custom content for yourself, um, you're also going to need to get, get all those PDFs. So this is going to include your downloaded web content as well as PDFs that you created. So this is a light example. Um, I have just put, um, I have four different PDF documents here. Um, obviously, if this was the, if this was a virtual textbook for a course, you might have a hundred PDF documents. You might have thirty PDF documents. It's not going to be four, but for the sake of simplicity, I have you know just used a few here. Um, and this is just once again, this is an example of the one that I created myself, as opposed to a web page. Okay, this is where we start to get complicated. Okay, so you're going to have to sit down and figure out how you want these documents to appear, like the order that you want them to appear in, and you're also going to have to figure out how long these documents are. So you're going to go into, say, like Microsoft Word, and what you're going to be doing is you're going to be creating a table of contents in Microsoft Word, and you are going to estimate your page count based on the page count of the PDFs. It doesn't have to be accurate yet, though. You just want to do an estimation. Um, your table of contents itself is going to be page one. Oh, oh, um, or, I mean, you know, I don't know, if you wanted to include a cover or something to this that you made, you could do that too, and then that would be page one, and your table of contents would be page two, and so on and so forth. But you're just going to want to calculate, do a rough estimation of your page numbers. So this is an example of uh, a table of contents that I, that I made in, in uh, Microsoft Office, um, and it has the title of the course, and then it just sort of has, you know, the different materials and a page number. Um, but then um, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to combine all of our PDF documents with our table of contents um, all in the same folder that we're going to use. So I'm going to add that table of contents to my master folder that had the other files in it. So now those are all kind of in the same place. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to need to rename these PDF documents so that they appear in the same order that they will appear in the virtual textbook with the table of contents being first or second if you choose to use a cover. Um, so what I've, gone, what I've done is I've gone in here and I've renumbered them 001, 002. Um, if, if you're, if, so this would cover you if you don't have more than 999 pages. If you had over 999, you'd need to use, you know, like 0001 and 
that way. Um, the reason why I've done this this way is because when we get to the actual phase that we're going to compile it in, it makes it really easy because they just go in in the correct order. So I'm not sitting there like trying to drag and drop and rearrange. So I now have them all in this folder, and they're all numbered correctly. So now I'm going to combine all these documents in Acrobat Pro. There's two different ways that we can get to the screen we need. When we first open up the software, there is an option that says combine files into PDF, so you could click on that. Or, if you already had the software open, you could go to file, create, and then uh, combine files into a single PDF. All right? And then what we're going to do is that is going to open up a window, and it says add files using the drop down or drag and drop them here. So, I, so I'm going to open up my folder where I have all my documents, and I'm going to, you know, I'll click on the first file and do something like Control A to select all, and then I will drag them over into that window. And then once I do that, they are going to appear in the correct order. So here I have my files, and then I'm going to click on Combine Files. Okay, when I'm done with that, it is going to create a PDF document, and it is going to open it up. Um, at this point, you may want to go ahead and save it just to have it the way that it is um, if you're prone to you know, programs crashing on your computer. But at this point, all your documents are going to be in one place. Um, so what you're going to want to do at this point is you're going to want to kind of scroll through the document, and you're going to want to compare your page number, your estimated page numbers to the actual page numbers. And as you can see in this example, I have a page count of 20 in my table of contents, um, but, my, but, but when I combine them, I actually only have nine pages. So this is the big oops. Uh, my page count is off. This actually happens all the time. Now, usually it's not off like, it's not off by like 10 pages, but it's very easy for it to be off by like one or two pages. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go through, you're going to want to open up your Word document with your table of contents and you are going to want to scroll through and, and adjust your page numbers. So you're going to go to the first page of each document, um, and, you're gonna, and you're just going to want to make a notation of what those are. And you are going to want to, let me, let me actually step back here, previous page. Um, yes, and at this stage you're going to want to adjust your numbers in your Word document. So you're scrolling through and you're being like, wait, this doesn't start on page 9, it starts on page 8, and you're going to change it in the Word document. Then what you're going to do is you are going to save that Word document again as a PDF document. So then what we're going to do is we're going to go into the master PDF that we've already compiled, and we're going to delete the old PDF document using the method that I just showed you earlier to delete pages. So now what I'm going to have is I'm going to have that compiled document minus the incorrect table of contents. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my combined files dialog using the method that we just looked at, and it's going to open up that drag and drop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag my new table of contents in there, and I'm going to drag the compiled document that has all the other PDFs in it. So in other words, the one that I removed the old table of contents from. And then we're going to recombine these documents. So then what's going to happen is my new table of contents is going to appear in that document. Okay, so the next step is if you want to, you can go ahead and link your page numbers to um, the corresponding parts of the virtual textbook, um, which is really nice for your students because when they open up the table of contents, they can just click on a page number and it will jump to that part. Okay, so the way that we're going to do this is we have to, go, we have to open up the, the document go back to our tools panel so you can click on tools and then under your content editing which will appear in Acrobat Pro which is the one at the top you can add or edit a link you want to click on that and when you click on that it is going to give you the option to drag like you can drag a square area out so you are going to drag a square area out. Now you can either do this around the page numbers, or you could do this around the whole title. So like I could have done it around the whole create a flicker effect using 3D lights if I wanted. But I usually just do the page numbers because it's a little easier. So once you, once you drag that square out, you're going to get a dialog box that pops up. And there's going to be some options in here. Um, you can use a visible rectangle for your link. You can make it an invisible rectangle. Um, once again, if you're, you, you're going to present your students with a virtual textbook, um, what you really want to do is inform them on how they're going to use it. So you would tell them, hey, 
there's a table of contents, and if you click on the page numbers, it'll jump to the page. So I usually use an invisible rectangle because it's a little less annoying. And then what I'm, and then what you're going to do is um, another when you click OK out of that dialog, another one's going to pop up that says Set Link. So you're going to click Set Link, and it is going to give you a little a little outline there. You're going to right click on that outline because the thing is at this point we have assigned the clickable area but we haven't told it what to do yet so we're going to right click on it and then after we right click on it we're going to get a link properties dialog that pops up you are going to want to click on the action tab right there and then you're going to want to select go to the page go to page in this document and you're going to click edit and when that pops up you are going to tell it what page you want the, docu the document to jump to. So in this case, I want it to go to page two because that's page two. So I'm going to change. I'm going to put page two in. And then you may want to adjust your zoom because the default is I think it just says auto or something. I usually use fit width. Um, there's a lot of options here. The options that I do not like. What they're going to cause your document to do is when you click on the number two and it goes to page two, it's going to resize the window size for the PDF document and I, and I don't like when it does that because maybe I have some different things spread out on my screen so but if you select fit with when you click on that number it should keep the document size the same okay so then what you, you're gonna click OK and it's gonna take you back out so now you can actually see it says go to page in this document page two, zoom to fit the width you're gonna click OK okay now this is the tedious part you have to go in and do this for every single page number that you have um, and whenever you are done you can also add additional internal links so like let's say that um, you get to the end of a certain section um, and you want to say hey if so in, in in this particular tutorial it referred to this other part of the book you could create a link that will jump and, and bring some students back to whatever that other tutorial was so you can create other internal links just besides besides just the page numbers like maybe on the web page you included it even said in our in our previous tutorial you could actually make a clickable area around previous tutorial and make it a visible rectangle and oh, it would just make it easier for students to navigate the document um, okay so that is if that would work well if all you had was a bunch of PDF documents but some of us are gonna have video files as well that we want to include as part of the as part of the virtual textbook, um, but unfortunately, we can't include a video inside of our master PDF document. So, if we want to provide video content as part of this virtual textbook, um, what we're going to want to do is get everything inside of a single folder. So, let's take a step back for a second and picture what the final product is going to look like that we're actually delivering to students. Um, if, if all you have is a bunch of PDF documents, you would just give students a master PDF file. If you want to include video content, you would create a folder, and you'd call that folder whatever you want. When students enter that folder, this is what it should look like. Um, you should have the master PDF document, so whenever they double-click the folder, there'd be the PDF. That would be where you've compiled everything. But then there would be another folder called video content. Before you start to link any of this video content, it is critical that you set everything up in the proper structure. So before you create the links, you would want to make sure all of your videos are already located inside of the correct folder. Otherwise, whenever whenever you create the internal link that's going to go to the video, it's not going to be able to find it. So. Um, at this stage, once you get everything organized properly in the folder, you're going to want to link from a section within your PDF document to these other files. So the way that this works is, um, I, I, I would have a PDF document, or I, I would have a part of my PDF document, and I, I would want, in this case, I just said, please review this video material, and I have the word link, and, and I'm going to create a link there. Um, you might choose to do it differently. Like, you might go ahead and you may want to just, um, you know, like I said, as part of an existing tutorial, go ahead and, and, and put a visible rectangle on something that they can click on. So um, whenever I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this using the same process that I had earlier. So in other words, um, 
I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click add, add or edit link. I'm going to draw out a clickable area. I'm going to do set link. I'm going to, you know, but the difference is whenever I first bring up the clickable area, I'm going to actually want to click on a different option. So the option that came up as default the first time was go to page view. Um, but I actually want to click on a different option, which is open a file. So when I click on open a file, I am going to have to tell the software where to locate that file. So this is why it's critical that all of the videos are already in their final destination. Because if you have it sitting, say, on your desktop, when you, when you make the link, but then you turn around and move it into that folder, the link is going to be looking for it on a desktop instead of in that folder. So you want to make sure you have it in the right spot, and then you're going to click open. And now, it all, you know, basically the links inside of your PDF document are going to work. Um, assuming that at the end of that process, you save it. It's very critical that you save at the end of that process so it maintains all the, all the, the work you've done. So what you would do is at the beginning of the semester, you would just give your students that master folder that contains your PDF document and your video files. Okay, so let's keep on moving. All right, let's talk about the pros and cons of the standalone virtual textbook. One of the pros is that it gives you the greatest amount of control over organization. Um, you can put these in any order that you want. You can put in your table of contents. You can create internal links that your students to make it easier for your students to navigate. Um, the other cool thing is that all of your information is neatly organized in a single PDF, in a single folder, or a single zip file. Um, and, and I already mentioned the benefits of making it easier to navigate for students. Um, there are some significant cons, though. Um, you may end up with a gargantuan file. If you have 20 video tutorials and a, and a massive PDF file, I mean, your virtual textbook could literally be gigabytes, which makes it more difficult to deliver to students, um, especially if you're trying to upload it to your LMS or something like that, because you, you may be teaching a class that's online only that doesn't meet face-to-face. -face. Um, it requires a lot of work on the part of the instructor. Um, whenever it's time to make updates, those can be complicated because you have to go in and the pages out of the PDF, which means you're and then substitute in the new ones, and then you're going to have to go back in and redo your table of contents, so on and so forth. Um, you are going to need Acrobat Pro for this, which is uh, a piece of software that costs money. Um, and this method, that more so than method two, poses some potential legal issues, which we are about to get into. So let's talk about legal considerations here when I'm creating a virtual textbook. Um, what, I, what I'll start out by doing is giving you some definite duties. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I work in film quite a bit. And our area deals with a lot of media issues. So I am familiar with a lot of court cases. And um, you should not include virtual textbook images that you have seen from a physical textbook. Um, because this is for the same reason. If, if, you have a, uh, if you have a class, you're not supposed to just copy a whole textbook and give students you know, copies. Um, it's the same idea. You shouldn't be scanning images from textbooks. Um, you should not send your students a login to a paid site. So here's an example. Um, there's a site called lynda.com. They have all kinds of great video tutorials from all kinds of matter. However, you have to be a paid member to access those videos. So let's say that you as a faculty member, you know, the school pays for you to have a login. It has not paid for your students to have a login. So you shouldn't be sending out to your students, hey, everybody, here's my username and password for this paid site. Y'all log in and look at the video. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, by the same token, you should not be creating PDFs or downloading video files from paid sites. You should only be using, you know, grabbing PDFs or downloading video files if the stuff is free and available for everyone out there. Um, what's my next point? Only include materials in your textbook that are, are free and widely available on the internet. So no, no paid sites, no subscription-based sites, uh, none of that. Um, you want to attribute all of your sources. So whenever you create a PDF of a web page, um, it's normal that the, that the web address is actually going to appear at the top of each page. So that's nice. It kind of automatically includes that. Um, but what, whenever you put video tutorials and things, you may want to include the website and the file name of the video, or you may want to make like a master Word document that has like where all the videos came from or something like that. So you want to make sure you attribute. Um, whenever you are creating a link-based 
based website, there's no need for attribution because students are actually going to visit the actual web page as opposed to a, a downloaded version. Um, you shouldn't be selling your textbook to students or anyone because this, this is your content. Now, if you if you created a virtual textbook and it was all your own original content, that might be a different story. Um, but if you compiled it from web-based resources that you don't own the rights to, you definitely would not want to sell the textbook because you don't own the rights to the material. Um, anytime you are in doubt about this, you can ask the author of the content or the or the owner of the web page if it is okay for you to include that as part of the class. Um, this would more so be for methods two or three, though, um, especially method three. Because remember, if you're only using method one, you do not have to ask for permission. You only will link to the material. Now, if you're in a situation where you're only downloading the video as like a backup for yourself, like in case that video file disappears two weeks before the final, it's probably okay to not necessarily get permission because you're only going to use it for a very limited period of time, and then. And, and then in subsequent terms, you're going to go ahead and get new material um, that's still out on the internet. So here's some food for thought. If any of you guys are familiar with fair use doctrine, um, basically the fair use doctrine tells us when it's okay to use copyrighted material without paying for it. And one of the times that you can use copyrighted material is for ed educational purposes. And in fact, that's one of the biggest exclusions to copyright law. Is that if it's for education, you, you sometimes can use the material for free. However, the law around this is complicated because there's another part of fair use doctrine that states that if the use of the material, even if it's educational, interferes with the owner's ability to profit from the sale of said material, then its use will not be permitted. This is exactly why you can't get a desk copy of a textbook and then copy the whole thing and just give students paper copies of the textbooks because that prevents the, band, the, the publisher from making money on it. Um, so even though you are using it for education and education use general, it allows you to use copywritten material for free. That's an exclusive. Um, this is all that's given to students for free because you interfering with the website. Okay, so moving on to the next web, the, 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 the other side of it is that there are websites that are out there for free on the internet, and they are free, but you need to realize that, that a lot of times the reason why there's, they're free is because the content creator is making money off of advertising. That's how other, you know, that, that's why they have a vested interest in making all these tutorials, because they're making money on the advertising. So there is the potential that whenever you are going to, um, you know, save a PDF of a web page or download a video, you, know, you could be interfering with the website's ability to generate revenue because if students visited the web page as it exists, they would be able to click on those page advertisements. Now they may or may not do it, but if you were giving download the video you are removing the student's ability to click on those paid links. So therefore, it could be construed that you have the website's ability to make money. Um, now, a case like this has not gone to court yet, to my knowledge, but it does not hurt to err on the side of caution, especially if you're going to be using method three. So here's what I would really encourage you to do. If you're going to use method three, you should ask all of those content creators if it's okay if you download their material to present to students in your class. And you can do that via email, and if they give you the okay, you're good to go. You have permission to use it. Um, but, but what I would advise you to do otherwise, if you can't get permission to use all the content in that way, is to go ahead and use method 2.5, um, which is the best of both, both worlds of one and two. So, so just use method 2.5 one more time. You would actually be creating a link-based virtual textbook, which you do not need permission to do, because remember, you're just pointing students in the right direction. You're saying, hey, hey go to that, that web page. It's already free. There's nothing wrong with that. But you would be, for yourself, creating personal backups of the video files, PDF backups of the web, pi web pages, so that in the event that a site goes down during the course of the term, you could provide that information to students as a backup. Um, but at the end of the term, if you want to teach the course again, you would just go ahead 
can't find a new video or a new website to use instead of the one that was changed or taken down. And that I would respect the content creators who took down or changed the material in the first place. Um, so if, if once again, if you're going to do the message, you should probably be getting permission from all the content creators. Um, but if you use method 2.5, you are probably good to go for educational use. Um, that wraps up our presentation on how to create a virtual textbook. Um, if any of you guys have questions, feel free to contact me. My email address is bptree, that's P-I-T-R-E, at atlantatech.edu. I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have or provide minor technical support. Like if you get to a certain part of it, the process and you're like, I I'm trying to do this, but I'm not seeing how it works. Um, so once again, if you have any questions, feel free to con contact me at bptree at atlantatech.edu. And that wraps it up. Thanks.